Well, hello, hello, and welcome to another recording of Two Geeks and a Marketing Podcast. We are back for more news, tech content, and wisdom from the world of marketing. Joining me, a man on a mission to keep marketing simple, the voice of the Marketing and Finance Podcast, and the host of the Rog Vlog video series, I give you Mr. Roger Edwards. Oh, thank you so much. And of course, you are also a man on a mission, this time to demystify digital marketing. You are the host of the Content Marketing Studio video podcast. Please welcome everyone, Monsieur Pascal Fintoni. Well, thank you very much. And Roger, we have many reasons to be happy today. To begin with, the sun is shining, the temperature is going up. We have the teaser trailer of Obi-Wan Kenobi, the, the TV series. Oh, oh. We're also celebrating the birth of Mark Asquith Baby with his wife, Sam. Mark Asquith is a co-founder of Captivate.fm. We're using to host this podcast. But also, it's number 70, 70. Wow. Wow. <laughs> And that is, I think, Pascal, if I'm not mistaken, 560 news items. We've done the numbers. That's also 140 content spotlights. 280 marketing tech and apps reviewed. More than 490 historical events, Roger. More than 140 shout-outs to amazing content creators. And 67 film marketing campaign discussed just for you, people. My goodness. I mean, when you actually look back at that record, that is a hell of a lot of content. And you know what? Lots of people have been very kind to give us a shout out on the socials over the last week or so. So thanks very much to Soma for talking to us on Twitter. Soma, Soma said, I have recently been enjoying the podcast, still listening to back-ended episodes as I'm behind, but love you and Pascal's tips and honesty about business and marketing. It's deeply refreshing. Plus, I love the movie marketing <laughs> references you guys talk about. I think we're hitting the spot, Pascal. And Chris Fox, uh, again, very kindly gave us a shout out on LinkedIn, uh, especially liked the superb owl uh, variation on Super Bowl that we were talking about last week. And of course, Bruce Daisley, who was uh, your shout out last week about his book, also talked to us on Twitter. So guys, please talk to us on Twitter, talk to us on LinkedIn, let us know what you think of the show. Good and bad, you know, if there's anything you don't like, tell us that as well as the stuff that you do like. We're always wanting to listen to your feedback. Yes, thanks very much, Roger. Can I just say, you know, when someone mentioned about the honesty about business and marketing, when you and I, all those months ago, that was kind of spring 2020, we were discussing the podcast and this raison d'etre and, you know, the themes we're going to cover, we wanted to be and try to be, you know, the voice of reason, of calm and kind of uh, you know, having a considered approach to doing marketing. And the fact that others have, have spotted that to me is just so wonderful. Yeah, absolutely right. And we, we've got to we've got to say it like it is. You know, there's a lot of lot of really great stuff happening in marketing, but there's also a lot of scams. There's also a lot of people out there talking complete rubbish about marketing as well. We're here to try and put the record straight. The movie marketing references that some has picked up as well. So the world right now has um, gone a little crazy with the Batman, but you have chosen a different version. You're taking us back in time. Yes, we are going to go back to 1989 to talk about the Batman film from nearly 30-odd years ago, the one starring Michael Keaton and Jack Nicholson. I was so much younger then. I just can't wait to actually tell you a bit more what I was up to when we had the premiere in Bordeaux. But before we do so, let's go through our usual segments with the start of In the News. According to a survey by YouGov, 20% of UK consumers are planning to listen to more podcasts in 2022, followed by streaming video with the second biggest growth indicator at 18%. While this so happens, our LinkedIn is launching a podcast network with in-house shows as well as programs from industry figures. Reid Hoffman, the co-founder of LinkedIn, will co-host a podcast about personal entrepreneurship called The Startup of You. Instagram is introducing auto-generated captions in 17 languages for videos on its app. This announcement came a day after Instagram confirmed it is ending support for its standalone app IGTV to focus on reels. 
TikTok is extending the length of its video clips to 10 minutes, a massive increase from its three minutes limit, no doubt to keep up with competitors to challenge YouTube and Instagram Reels. Kraft Heinz has launched a single in collaboration with singer-songwriter Kellis. This campaign follows other consumer packaged goods firms using pop culture to reinvigorate legacy brand for new consumer groups. While according to Reuters, Amazon will be shutting down all 68 physical bookstores across the US and the UK, as well as Amazon 4-star and Amazon pop-up shops. Old Spice is going back in time by resurrecting actor Dolph Lundgren's 80s movie persona via deepfake technology. You can watch a series of over-the-top action flick parodies depicting the dangers of sweating too much on Hulu, YouTube, Twitter and TV. So funny. Well, EE has launched its House of Fiber to demonstrate its full Fiber Max broadband. The hyper-connected house, Roger, has an interactive kitchen with smart cooking devices, a smart diffuser, a smart speaker, a gamer's paradise, a wellness gym, VR headsets, smart bikes, and wearables technology. <laughs> wow. Wow. Some good so, stuff there today. I have to talk about Dolph Rundgren. Uh, I have mm. to. So... Um, little claim to fame, I met him, shook his hand, I got him to sign one of my DVDs at Comic-Con in London. I think that was 2018. And I got my picture taken next to him. Actually, I forgot to bring it. I've got it in one of my kind of um, uh, album photos. He's a massive bloke. I mean, and when I met him, I think he was in the late 60s and it was monster fit. But I love, so we have Old Spice going back in time with the 80s. We have Christ Hines who is looking to connect with current pop culture, to connect with audiences. And I just find the whole concept very interesting because Old Spice will be known to perhaps our generation. Therefore, we have a connection with Dolph Rundgren because you and I would have spent many, many um, uh, happy afternoon at the cinemas or watching VHS cassette with, with him. And then you've got the current generation who's trying to be targeted by Kraft Heinz using, of course, a very current and popular singer-songwriter. Yeah, there's there's a real sort of retro thing going on at the moment, isn't there? I mean, we 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 often talk about the '80s. We often talk about that you and I are children of the '80s, video games and and music and that sort of thing. But uh, there does seem to be a bit of this sort of nostalgia for retro, Old Spice. I mean, I I can remember old. My dad used to have Old Spice. <laughs> I mean, my goodness, and it, and it's it sits in the category of of really dodgy aftershaves, doesn't it? Old, old Spice, and there was Brute as well, wasn't there? You know, uh, <laughs> Brute aftershave and and High Karate. Do you remember High Karate? I, I remember the advert well. very well. Oh yeah, the woman used to come in through the door, and there used to be all those yeah. sort of silly sound effects and all of that. I'm sure there was a there was a Henry Cooper and Muhammad Ali brute advert with something yeah. like "floats like a butterfly, stings like a bee," or, or "stinks the like pun- a bee more." <laughs> yeah, that's it. The, the great the great smell of brute and the punch of Ali. Oh my goodness! But yeah, I I, I don't know whether it's just a, a a fact that a lot of us are getting a, a little bit older, and that nostalgia sort of takes us back. To to our younger days but it just seems that everybody's getting onto this 80s bandwagon at the moment and, and i'm all for it i'm not i'm not oh, c- completely um you're not the only one that spotted this actually there's been commentators in the industry saying that many brands have simplified their logos for example and it has a retro feel to them and people are suggesting it's about calm it's about you know bringing the tone down a, a fraction. But just very quickly, you knew that if you got a present at Christmas on your birthday, that was Old Spice or Brute, the other person I made no effort whatsoever to, um, <laughs> to, look for, to look for a present. And you end up having to pass it on to somebody else because you don't want to obviously be using Old Spice or Brute, probably end up with a skin rash or something. What is interesting <laughs> about the, um, the Kraft Heinz, when you say that they're launching a single, just to be clear about the news, this is a real single. People could actually buy a cassette. That's the thing. That's the PR stand that you would buy a cassette. And um, talking of which, I had a quick look. Uh, I've kept many um, cassettes, particularly my Prince collection, which is uh, interesting in view of the film you've chosen for today. And I went online and cassettes, I can get about between five to 10 pounds per cassette uh, wow. on the uh, on the online market. So um yeah, no, absolutely fine. Can we quickly talk about Amazon shutting down the 68 physical bookstores and more, if you include the four-star and the pop-up? Do we need to worry, or is it basically an experiment that they went through and they can afford to, frankly, move on to the next thing? 
I don't know about this, Pascal. I mean, I have always had this theory that quite a lot of people who buy books online still actually like to go and physically browse a bookshop. Um, and that's maybe the problem. What people will do is they'll go to a bookshop and they'll, they'll they'll maybe even pick a book off the shelf. They'll sit down because a lot of bookshops, Waterstones in Edinburgh, for example, have nice leather sofas all over that you can sit down on and, and have a read. But they don't actually buy the books from the bookshops. They go back home and they either buy the Kindle edition online or they just order it from, from Amazon. And, and may, maybe, unfortunately... You know that that that's hit the profit margins a little bit. It's not cost effective to keep these shops open, and that's why they're closing them down. I hope it's not the end of bookshops, but I have to hold my hands up and say I can't remember the last time I actually bought a book from a bookshop, and I have myself have been guilty of going in, browsing, sitting down, reading, but not buying. So I'm probably part of the problem as well. So I probably can't complain too much about it. But I think it would be sad if they disappeared forever. No, absolutely. And what is interesting about Amazon, we've uh, mentioned in the news before, they've had uh, other attempts such as setting tech in specialist stores, setting food as well. So they are experimenting. And, and I think that is part and parcel of being the world of marketing to do some test to look at the data. If it doesn't work, close, move on. And happily, if you're working where in, in an environment where there's no blame culture, you can actually do more of that. Just to close, then the, the first two. So you read out the YouGov stats. Twenty percent of UK consumers planning to listen to more podcast, and then LinkedIn launching a podcast network. Now, fortunately, as they've done so far, it's what's about the elite, which I think is just uh, frankly annoying. You know that LinkedIn yeah. will always only allow the elite to have LinkedIn Live, and then you and I have to wait five years before we can have it. I know that LinkedIn audio rooms are coming soon there's no date but someone suggesting the summer what would be lovely if linkedin would allow particularly those who are new to podcasting to actually publish their podcast on the linkedin network yeah absolutely right i mean i actually did find somebody who has access to the linkedin rooms uh, or whatever they're called the other day and 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 I was actually there at the right time, so I was able to go in and listen. And it's very much, as you would expect, like Clubhouse or Spaces on Twitter. Um, and the interface looked very similar. It was nice, and, and the audio quality was very good. There's no replay facility at the moment, so I couldn't go back and listen right. to, it, to it later on. Uh, but, yeah, LinkedIn do have this annoying habit of only giving access to the superstars. And that's fine. That's fine. I understand why, because it means that the reach is there. But, you know, there are a lot of really good creators out there who maybe don't have the mega followings of these big um, uh, household names. And, you know, it might be quite nice if LinkedIn acknowledged that sometimes and gave access to people like you and I who work just as hard to produce great content. But we are always, as you say, at the bottom of the list when it comes to rollout. And I hope we don't have to wait five years for this one, Pascal. Oh, absolutely. Now, just in closing, your prediction about the House of Fibre. Would you be keen to have a full interactive kitchen? You know, I know you cook a lot. Um, when is your curry night? Is it Thursday or Fridays? No, we do. We do make our curries on Saturdays. Saturdays, mainly. right? Yeah. Uh, do you know it, it's funny? Um, I, I was I was visiting my son yesterday up in Aberdeen, Pascal, and he's got a couple of Alexa um, smart speakers in his house, and he's shouting out to them, and he gets it to play music, and he gets it to turn on this and turn on that. Again, maybe it's a generational thing. I. I a kitchen's a kitchen. I don't want the kettle to talk to me. I don't want the I don't want the stove to talk to me. I don't want the fridge to announce how cold it is inside. You know, I just want to be able to put the kettle on and boil water. I just want to put the stove on and cook food. I want to open the fridge and get a can of iron brew out. I'm not interested in having a conversation with these items. So house of fiber, not interested at all. Um, as long as long as um, you know that doesn't make me come across as a technophobe. I love technology, um, and I've got a store about technology i want to tell you later on but i just sometimes think we take these things too far and you know kettles don't need to talk to us they just boil water for goodness sake. no and i think for me the kitchen is almost similar to me to the the um, artist studio 
where you know you you go um, low tech to no tech, and you, you spend a moment to create something, and there should be part of the house that are protected from the invasion of tech, and then you could go into that environment that like we are today to do something uh, to that. So we've learned that you should not buy Roger Old Spice or Brute. <laughs> Even though we do love love the 80s, we look forward to podcasting on LinkedIn and keep your take away from the kitchen. Thank you very much. Let's slow things down a little with the content spotlights. Now, in this segment, Roger and I surprise each other with a discovery from the interweb, an article, a podcast, a video that just help us reflect what it means to be a marketer in today's economy. So, Roger, what have you got for us this week? Well, Pascal, I think this might be a first for me in this section of the show. I'm actually pointing to a LinkedIn post as opposed to an article or a video or a podcast. Now, that might sound, oh, a LinkedIn post, that doesn't sound very interesting. Well, it is very, very interesting. And this LinkedIn post was posted by a gentleman called Peter Sumpton. And Peter is a marketer, just like you and I. And I just spotted this um, this post and absolutely loved it from the moment that I saw it. Now, he has got a visual in there, which obviously is the thing that sucked me in. And his title is The Biggest Cons in Marketing. The Biggest Cons in Marketing. And effectively, it's just a list of things that he thinks are cons in marketing or myths in marketing. And and I guess he posted this post in order to get people to add in the comments below their own cons and, and to actually expand on his list. But it's a lovely list, and I agree with pretty much all of them. And because it's not a long list, I'm going to very, very quickly go through this list of marketing cons. So the first thing is there is no secret source. So he's sort of saying, I I hate to let you in on this secret. There is no generic secret that will immediately work for you. All businesses are unique. You know, if people are promising you results within seven days, results within 24 hours, it's likely to be a con. You know, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. And, you know, that is one of the, the lessons that we all need to learn. But unfortunately, quite a lot of us fall for it when we see somebody advertising what looks like a quick solution. Second one, a logo is a brand. And of course, we know that a logo is part of a brand, but a brand is made up of so much more than that. It's it's not only the colors and the logo, it's also what people are saying about your business behind your back. It's about the culture of your business. It's about you what you stand for it's about what your products do it's so much more but that myth that con that that is out there is that all you need to have a brand is to get somebody on fiverr to knock you up in logo and your brand is sorted that's a con that's a con the next one anyone can run your social accounts but what you're saying is a social media channel is another communication channel in the same way as advertising on billboards is a communication channel or TV advertising is a communications channel. And unless you're an absolute expert in that communications channel, it's possible that you haven't got the expertise to do it yourself. So get the people in who know what they're talking about. And as a sort of add on to that, the next con or the next myth that he's talking about is that TV advertising is dead. Mm. Now, I'm just going to refer back to my uh, spotlight last week when I talked about the Super Bowl adverts. We know how much money was invested and how many hundreds of millions of people watch the TV ads during the Super Bowl. TV is not dead. It's just one of those myths that's peddled by people that want to get you to believe that. Next one, marketing is just about promotion. Ah, I love that. You know, I know. We talk about this on the show all the time. It drives me insane. Marketing is not just advertising. Marketing is not just promotion. But so many people these days talk about marketing when they really just mean promotion. They talk about marketing when they just mean advertising. But that is doing everybody a disservice. When you talk about it as promotion and advertising, you're excluding all the other things like consumer research, positioning, strategy, product development. Marketing is so much more than just promotion. Please don't fall into that trap. Next 
con. You don't need to have objectives. Again, we know this tends to happen. You don't set yourself a goal. And then when your marketing campaign fails, that's when the accountants or the high ups in the business say that marketing don't know what they're doing. But if you set yourself some goals, you've got something to measure yourself against. Next one, vanity metrics. We all know about this one. It's not about the number of followers you have. It's not about the number of likes. It's not about the number of thumbs ups or thumbs down. You've got to have proper measurements in place and thumbs up likes don't pay the bills. Next one, you've got to be number one on Google. And again, he's saying, well, for what? What exact word term do you need to be first for? And in what country and for who? Yes, you, you want people to be able to find you, but the obsession with being number one on Google and then getting wrapped up in all the black black magic terms of SEO, that is a rabbit hole you don't want to go down on. Next one, email doesn't work. He says, yes, it does. It's just that a lot of people aren't very good at it. You know, and it's not just about getting yourself a newsletter. It's not just about getting yourself a list and sending out a lead magnet. It's a strategy and a load of tactics that need to be worked on, need to be crafted. And if you're not an expert in it, get out there and find somebody who is an expert. Next one, you don't need a qualification to be a marketer. Well, of course you don't. But if you did have one, it would make you a better marketer. It's just a matter of fact isn't it? If you get a qualification in something, you're going to learn more. You're going to find out more. So you don't need a qualification, but if you get one, it will help you be better. Two more to go, Pascal. Market leading. How many people say we are market leading? But again, what does it mean? Leading in what respect? Is it the biggest? Is it the quickest? Is it the cheapest? Most reviews? Fastest delivery? It, again, can just be meaningless. We are a market leading company. Well, yeah, what does that actually mean? And I suppose tied to that is award winning. You know, <laughs> Sorry. What does that mean? Award I mean, actually, I, I have my hands up. I, I have used that phrase myself, an award winning podcaster. I have won awards for the marketing and finance podcast. But actually, people don't follow awards that often. They don't buy awards. Um they buy products that solve problems that they have. So there are, I quite like a lot of those. I love them all, actually. Uh, and there was an, an interesting, I'm just now looking at this. There's, there's at least 15 more in the comments below now, but I'm not going to go and, and add to the, the original. So thank you, Peter Supton. It really made me smile. I agree with, with all of these things. And I'm really pleased that for the first time, I've actually focused on a LinkedIn post as my content spotlight. Yeah, no, it's a new addition to the content spotlight as, as a format. And as I'm listening to you, you saw me smiling, nodding, even laughing at some of those because, A, I hear them too often, you know, much to my distress because as an occupation, I was reflecting on this yesterday, I was delivering a workshop in um, in Harrogate and we're talking about marketing as a profession. I would say I'll take the view that from the... Um, late 40s to early 50s after the second world war where there was an attempt to get more people to buy products after years and years of um, you know essentially privation the there was an attempt to communicate and like all profession you know over time uh, it has improved has matured and so on but actually there's so much misinformation and misunderstanding and i think the biggest cons the reason why Peter list them is because they are being shared and they are being essentially presented by many people who either don't know what they're talking about, and you could have said to a point they are maybe innocent. But my biggest worry, and she's one of the reasons I use this podcast as a platform, as you know, is those who know they are lying and yet they keep going. Mm -hmm. Let me give you two examples, which uh, will not surprise you, are SEO related. So I was talking to an organization two days ago now, and this is the advice they were given. They use WordPress, like many organizations, and of course they have the Yoast SEO plugin. And they were told by the agency that they're using, unless all the, um, all the traffic light on the Yoast SEO plugin is green, your website will be blacklisted by Google. And this poor Good. soul with so many things to do, let alone running the website, has been trying desperately for fear of getting blacklisted to get all the dials green on Yoast SEO. Where in my view, well, just, if you haven't got time, just move on, leave them red. It's not going to be a problem. The other advice that they were given, which was shocking, I mean, I couldn't actually resist but spend a bit of time on the one-to-one -one basis to help them out. They were told by the agency, 
remove your blog completely so that the, the traffic can concentrate on your commercial pages, your conversion will be much higher. And no. overnight, the traffic just plummeted down to zero. Do you see what I mean, Roger? That's, and oh, that is just shocking. That is just shocking behavior. Yeah. And, and, and of course, the agency wanted hundreds of pounds a month <laughs> to look after the website. You know, that, that's what you do. So, yeah, we, we must continue. You know, Peter, you, I, so many others out there that are part of our kind of network, we need to continue to be the voice of reason. But maybe like Peter, we need to be more, more vocal, which is something that you and I have discussed in the past. Absolutely right. We've got to say it as it is. Now, completely. Talking of saying it as it is, I've got a good selection for you today. An article from eConsultancy.com. We've not been back to that website for a while. This is an article written by Imagine Director of eConsultancy, who also runs his own agency, Sim Advice, Rich, Richard Robinson. The title is as follows. How can marketing leaders make 2022 the year of the great retention? And what I like about it, which is something that we don't see often enough, is more of a reflection. Do you remember back in the days when blogs started in the 90s and 2000s? They were really there as a journal, as a diary for business owners, leaders, and others just to reflect and share their thoughts on something and stimulate a debate as opposed to being hijacked by those um, cowboys usually working for uh, agencies <laughs> and so on. So, and, and I must be careful, they are... Um, talented people out there in the thousands. But uh, so Richard is looking at two things. He's reflecting on the e-consultancies on annual digital and marketing trends predictions from the founder, Ashley Fridlin. He's also looking at something that we covered in, in the news, the Marketing Week recently published annual career and salary surveys. Do you remember we, the, um, the highlight in the news was around this idea of marketers actually leaving yeah. um, positions because of an, a number of reasons. And what essentially Richard is looking at from those two kind of uh, elements is this idea of the new realities for leaders. Number one, hybrid is here to stay, both in terms of um, your team working remotely and as well in the office, but also the communication with the customers. Talking of communication with customers, connection is going to become more and more personal and more and more direct with customers, which you and I would obviously um, welcome. And then finally, the war for marketing talent is only going to intensify because of the different forces. And I would add on to that, again, this reminder that we now know, and marketing professionals have expressed their views that they don't feel particularly valued and looked after by all, and therefore they're looking for either a career change, which is not actually what we want to hear, you and I, or simply going elsewhere. And then his reflection is across three segments if you call them that so the first one is going back to the war for talent as a new reality the second one is that we must champion a culture of learning in the organization and i would go as far as saying and even if you are working on your own then you should try and find a way for yourself to you know have that always learning a kind of mindset on and then finally empowering employees he's talking about this idea of how can marketing leaders make 2022 the year of the great retention? Because his warning is, if not, it will become the, the year of the great resignation. We're going to see the, the people just moving on. So very, very quickly, when it comes to the war for talent, is um, rather you know, surprised and perhaps a little disappointed to see that the large, large number of brands that were surveyed by e-consultancy have opted to hire to kind of hire talent to actually subcontract some of the marketing activities as opposed to developing in-house talent, which uh, I think, like I would agree with him, is a big surprise because the value you would get from actually having people in-house delivering the majority of your marketing efforts is, is um, you know, beyond measure. This idea of a culture of learning and is saying to people, be careful. It's not just learning the tools and the tricks and the hacks and the app is also learning about the soft skills and the mindset to stay one step ahead of customers. So this idea of hybrid and enjoy more connections. And then four, the third one, empowering employees, get people to really understand that beyond the technical discipline, they have to learn about being agile, adaptable, to know about innovation, experimentation, do some research, and always put the customer at the center of all your deliberations and decision making. Not a particularly long article, Roger, but one that really connected with me in context to what we're doing, but also a warning uh, to the industry. 
Yeah, and, and you know what? There's a great link between my content spotlight and yours because quite a lot of those biggest cons that I was talking about are actually some of the reasons why the marketing profession is being devalued over the last decade. And one of the reasons why people are getting fed up with it and one of the reasons why people are leaving. And we need to fix all of this. So it's it's all of the things that Richard is saying in his article, but it's also going back to those cons that I raised. We've got to start talking about marketing as a whole again, rather than focusing on those quick tactics that sometimes work, but always work if you do the full strategy. If you don't do the full strategy, then a lot of the times those tactics don't work. And that's what's creating a lot of this dissatisfaction. No, absolutely. And, and you know, I've, I really enjoy actually on this occasion, spending a bit longer on content spotlight to have a more thoughtful consideration. So once again, big thank you to Peter and Richard to allow, for allowing us, thanks to their hard work for publishing content online to be able to do that. Okay, let's speed things up, if you don't mind, Roger, with marketing tech and apps. <music> Okay, so Roger, what have you got for us this week to make life easier as a marketer or business owner? Well, what I've got for you this week to start off with is a quick little story, which I just have to tell you. So I mentioned earlier that I went up to Aberdeen yesterday to visit my son. Now, just south of Aberdeen, there's a little um, seaside village called Stonehaven, and there's a fantastic ice cream parlor in Stonehaven, and we wanted to have an ice cream there so we arranged with our son that he would get the train from Aberdeen to Stonehaven we would drive up to Stonehaven and we would meet him there to the start our visit now we got to Stonehaven railway station and I went up onto the platform to to meet the train that my, um, my son was on coming from Aberdeen and I saw something that I have not seen for many many years and that is a semaphore signal for the train line now i cannot remember the last time i saw a seminar for signal I'm, I'm thinking back 40 odd years when my grandfather was still alive for those of you who don't know what a semaphore signal is i'm hoping that um our amazing video producer tim is going to actually put a photograph up on the video for those of you who are listening to this a semaphore signal is effectively it looks like a lamp post and then at the top of the lamp post there's like a green and white it looks like a bit like a very thin flag and when the semaphore signal is level like that it means the train cannot pass that signal and when the semaphore signal goes up to 45 degree angle like that it means that the train can continue now obviously the modern technological equivalent of that is effectively the traffic light isn't it the red means the train can't go the green means it can but those semaphore signals date back to goodness knows back into the early 1900s and and honestly i had that absolutely amazing geek moment when i saw this semaphore signal i shouted to trisha my wife i said look at that semaphore (laughs) signal it's absolutely gorgeous i took photographs of it and it just reminded me pascal that Technology is, f- I love new technology. I love all these new toys that we get. But sometimes, do you know, the simplest ideas from way back still work. And it's obvious that at that part of the line, they've not felt the need to update them. And oh, it was just joyous to see that. Anyway, getting on to today's marketing tech and apps. I recently upgraded my iPad and my iPhone. They came to the end of their contract. And I always find this when I update, you know, all the data gets transferred across. But every time you log into every single website, every single app, it doesn't carry the password over. And, you know, sometimes I've not had to type the password in for these apps for months or even years. And a lot of the time I can't remember bloody password for that particular app and I then have to reset the password and it gets really stressful and annoying and it takes me ages so it made me have a look at is there a way to retain passwords but also retain the security that the passwords give you now of course the obvious route which I obviously missed and I hadn't turned on is the Apple keychain which allows you to create a series of um, passwords which will go across multiple devices so computers tablets and phones so for the for goodness sake if you're like me and you you have passwords on all these apps that you just make up in your own head rather than have some algorithm do it for you and then you face that stress that every time you upgrade to a new device it takes you days to 
get all the passwords back in alignment. For goodness sake, turn Apple Keychain on or the equivalent of Apple Keychain. But it made me look a little bit further. And I wondered whether there are any apps out there that can actually manage this for you. Now, of course, there are loads some of which are free, some of which aren't, and some of which actually cost quite a bit. The one that I found which was free, and by looking at it, I think it works really well and it actually um, is very intuitive and easy to use, is called Bitwarden. Now, this is actually a website, but there's also an app version of, of it as well. So I've had a look at this. I understand how it works. I think it can save me all that heartache that I've told you about. It almost like as a backup to Apple Keychain, I guess, and and obviously beyond Apple for the uh, the, the stuff that I um, have, which isn't Apple based. So Bitwarden.com will help you solve a load of your password problems. And you know your timing with regard to what is happening out there in the world yeah. about security, online security, the increase uh, in cyber threats and that kind of things. Maybe it's actually just what we need to do. A, reset the password where possible, but also then adopt a solution such as this one so that um, it can make life so much easier. Thank you very much for taking the time to do the research, Roger. Much appreciated. Now, my two selections for today, I'm pretty excited, actually, because <laughs> for a very, very long time, I've been promoting this tactic of creating a media CV. In fact, if memory serves, you were one of my first guinea pigs, this idea of being a guest on the podcast, being a guest at a conference, being a guest on a video uh, series or even a blog, and essentially helping the host make a decision to invite you because you can send to them a media CV. It is not a CV about seeking employment, but a CV about you as a guest, you as a content creator, and highlighting essentially the, the, the questions, the themes, and even examples of where you've been a guest before. So helping you with your personal brand. And my recommendation has always been, Roger, if you remember, to make this as visual as possible. And it's been hard, actually, to find the solution, and Canva can help a lot. But actually, if you've tried, it is actually quite hard to put together a written document on Canva. It's not designed for that. We're so, so lucky. There is a software engineer from Vienna who's come up with a solution called Loris Bernhardt, and he has created flowcv.io. I want you to imagine that on the left-hand side, you have the typical fields that you would expect in a CV, although for me it would be the media CV kind of sections. And then on the right-hand side of your screen, live, the CV starts to populate itself and starts to become visual. And then you can drag and drop, you can reorganize the boxes and so on, and live, your kind of visual media CV is taking shape. You can choose different templates, you can choose different colors, and you can make it really work for you, all free of charge. And once you're happy, you can download a PDF. And that's going to be really my go-to solution now for when I do the course on personal branding and online PR. So, Loris, a big, big thank you, and we'll give you a shout-out properly in the show notes as well. Now, the second one is actually from Adobe. So we go from literally a, a one-man band software engineer to the, the, the giant that is Adobe, who understand about supporting small businesses, but a number of things. And the one thing they've launched is Adobe Express, something you mentioned before, when it was used to be called Adobe Spark. Now, Adobe Express is really, really impressive. It's kind of Canva Plus, if I may use that analogy again. And I've used recently to create some logo for some specific programs. So I know that the logo is not a brand, Roger. I totally agree with you. <laughs> but to be able to illustrate a specific program within my um, kind of portfolio of services, I wanted a visual statement. And I will say that the Adobe logo maker is very, very clever. Using a bit of AI, kind of fairy dust to make life a little easier. You can go in there, you can put essentially your, the name of your program. You can even uh, specify some particularly kind of graphical elements, and then you can cycle through colors, uh, fonts, and that kind of things. And once you're happy, you can download. The one thing that is very nice with Adobe compared to Canva, because this is a free product, you can download a transparent background logo, which is very, very helpful. Whereas with Canva, as you know, you need to have the pro account. So Flow CV from Lois Bernard and Adobe Express, particularly the logo maker from um, this point of view of creating a visual statement. 
Fantastic. I'm definitely going to have a look at the uh, Flow CV thing from Loris. Um, I, yes, you are absolutely right. Um, you and I discussed putting together um, a CV like this years ago, and I did put one together. And do you know what? I think I, I still have a PDF version of it, but for some reason I must have deleted either the Word document or the PowerPoint that I created it on. So I've never actually been able to go back and edit it. I'll have to create it from scratch again. So I'm sure this will help. Yeah, and for me, just very quickly, I'd be able to literally facilitate a workshop where people would go live to create a media CV and get feedback from their peers around the room. It's just going to be a wonderful uh, little exercise. So as we've said before, this would not be possible without the hard work and vision from pioneers of the recent and distant past. It is time for This Week in History. <music> In 1953, for the first time, audiences are able to watch the movie world's most prestigious events, the Academy Awards, live from Hollywood's RKO Pantages Theatre with Bob Hope as the master of ceremonies. Wow, well, in 1981, RCA introduces the long-awaited video disc player, the SFT100 Selective Vision, Roger, having spent $200 million over 15 years developing the solution. Sadly, it turned out to be a complete commercial failure and the product was withdrawn from the market in 1984. In 1995, the world's first wiki, wiki wiki web, was created as where Ward Cunningham invites people to add and edit content. Now, a wiki is a database that can be a community collaboration. Cunningham has said the inspiration for the name wiki came from the wiki wiki shuttle bus he learned of during a trip to Hawaii. This, of course, paved the way for Wikipedia. And wow. I'm absolutely delighted I managed to read all of those wikis out without <laughs> cracking a smile. Well, and in 2000, Julia Roberts becomes the first actress ever to commend $20 million per movie for Erin Brockovich, released on March 17th, 2000. The film received five nominations at the 73rd Academy Award, and Julia Roberts won the Oscar for Best Actress. Wow. Well, we began and ended this week in history with reference to the Oscars. Once again, people will think that we were well organized and we spoke about honesty earlier <laughs> when we started the <laughs> show. This is pure chance because we do research separately. Now, I want to talk to you quickly about the video disc player. Now, I remember we had a friend, a family friend who had the Philips video disc player and this was like pure science fiction to us. Now, these were like, they were like golden or silver LPs, I remember vividly. They would go into this um, kind of machine, it was a huge machine, be sold up, and they would play a, a movie, or you could even play a game or interactive games and so on. But this um, kind of infamous SFT100, Selective Vision, RCA, began the promotion like years and years and years before finally it was released. I've spent, as I mentioned a moment, an absolute fortune. And by that time, the format had moved on to something else like CD-ROMs and DVDs and even Laserdiscs because when we say a video disc player, and when I say the LPs, Roger, it's because that's how it worked. You literally had, very much like an LP, a needle reading, obviously, the information and presenting it on your TV screen. And people had moved on to Laserdiscs because that was far more exciting and even the beginning of CD-ROMs and uh, DVDs. And it's just a lesson, isn't it, where... Even though you spend 200 million and 15 years, sometimes you've got to pick up the signals from the market and know when to call it quits. I can remember trying to convince my dad to get one of these. <laughs> um, and, and he wouldn't. I mean, they were very, very expensive, as you said. And at the time, I, I, the, there was only a handful of um, titles that were even available to buy as uh, as video disc but i think it was i was probably motivated by the fact that the bbc had had actually put out a doctor who laser disc and i think i was basing my entire desire for this laser display on the availability of probably one laser disc but yeah absolutely agree with you it, you know you have to know when to draw a line under things it's a lesson that if something takes 15 years to develop um, you're not doing it right. As in, you know, it, it just feels like uh, so many of those IT projects and sometimes even government projects where they keep going because actually not um, stopping it is almost feels more embarrassing than carrying on and even failing. 
I think it's called the sunk cost fallacy, isn't it? You almost think you've invested an amount of time, an amount of money, therefore you've got to go to the end. It's a bit like you go to a movie to watch a movie and you're sitting there halfway through thinking this is an utterly rubbish film, I hate this film, but you sit there until the end because you think that if you walk out, you'll have wasted your money, when in fact what you should probably do is walk out because you'll get at least half the, the movie time back into your life. And I think it's the same sort of thing. You know, well, we've come this far, we may as well go all the way, but actually you've got to know, as I say, when to draw the line under it. So I would agree, calculations on reading the wiki wiki um, item <laughs> without stumbling or, or almost like this on tongue twister. I just didn't know that was uh, the origin. I'm so pleased. Thank you very much. Yeah, and, and it's funny, isn't it? I use Wikipedia all the time when I'm doing research now. And I, I, I mean, I've, originally, I guess a lot of people say, oh, you know, Wikipedia is highly inaccurate and, you know, you shouldn't rely upon that. You should go to a proper online encyclopedia you know there was an originally a cd rom that microsoft had called encarta that's so much better than wikipedia but actually do you know i think that because it's a collabor collaborative um work now i think it is pretty accurate and it's it's become almost like that first port of call when you do some research for things Indeed, uh, I mean, you and I donate every year when we get that, that nice reminder from from the founders, and I love that that you also get the source. You can actually quote the source mm. you know, because there's all the citation that've been numbered, and it's so so convenient. I love the fact that they kept the design very simple. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming it's not changed much from the '90s, but well, I would say WikiWiki Web in 1995. That was a year before, really, I got involved with my first website project, and it feels like such a long time ago. But <laughs> once again. Why reinvent you know what's working very very well and the fact that it was inspired by the shuttle bus just I just love it I just think it's brilliant. <laughs> so listen, let's get back into the present. Thanks again, Roger. Let's get back into the present with our creators' shoutouts. Okay, Roger. So who is under the spotlight this week for you? Okay, I want to point you to a piece of content put together by a lady called Helen Packham. Now, Helen is a presentation coach. She helps people put together talks, speeches, presentations. She's also been a speaker at TEDx, and I think I'm right in saying that Helen actually organizes TEDx events now down south um, in, in England. And, and I just spotted this article that Helen has put together. It's called Seven common questions about storytelling answered now you know how much i love storytelling within the marketing context and also within the uh in the presentation the speech format and this article is really good it's short to the point and it's got those seven questions answered really simply and it really does focus your attention on the power of storytelling for presentations so this is almost like a creator's content shout out so helen's well worth checking out just for her expertise in presentations and speeches but today i'm specifically shouting out this piece of content that helen's put together and the link is in the show notes Thank you very much. And once again, without even discussing it, I did the same thing. I went for a creator's content shout out. How <laughs> intriguing. I want to let you know, all of you, about Chris Ducker. Firstly, the consultant, speaker, and author, Rise of the Youpreneur and Virtual Freedom. But recently, Chris went on a holiday, but still was able to do a bit of work. And what he's done is created a short but very simple video about behind the scenes of my remote online coaching setup. It's like a tech review, but more in terms of how he goes about making sure that he can really enjoy his time with his family whilst he was able to go away, or it was raining the day he was out and about, uh, but as well, how does he do it? How does he make it work? And the reason why I chose this one, Roger, is because there's also the simplicity of the video message and yes the richness of the information because sometimes people when they think video they may have tendency to overcomplicate or over engineer what you need to do and uh, so not only going to learn about how to work remotely and as chris has done but you're going to also see ah i see actually this video is very simple and maybe that should follow the same trend there's also a cameo for my goddaughter which is absolutely delightful so <laughs> the hyperlink is in the show notes but yeah it is my creators content shout out 
fantastic. Some great shout outs for some great content. Super. Well, listen, you made the promise to take us back to the 80s, Roger. Let's move on to film marketing. Okay, this is Batman, but the 1989 version. Let's watch the trailer. What do you do for a living? Lieutenant, is there a six foot bat in Gotham City? Nice outfit. You look fine. I didn't ask. I have given a name to my pain. What are you? I'm Batman. Where did he get those wonderful toys? My life is really ah! complex. Winged freak terrorizes. Wait till they get a load of me. Oh my goodness, talk about a trip <laughs> down memory lane. 1989, Roger. Uh, yes, please tell me, where were you? What did you do? <laughs> well, do you know what? This film, um, I loved it. And I got swept up in the hype in the lead up to its um, release. I think we're going to talk a lot more about that. It was called Batmania. And, you know, everybody was talking about Batman. Everybody wanted Batman logo T-shirts. Bat they all even wanted to um, get their Batman logo shaved into their hair and that sort of thing. So I was swept up by this. And I went to see Batman the night before... I was going on a works trip to Paris and we went to see the Batman at the cinema in Lancaster, which is where I was near where I was living at the time. Absolutely loved the film so much. We talked about it all the way on the bus to, because it was a bus trip we went to um, Paris. So it took us like, the best part of a day to get to Paris. So everybody was talking about Batman. And do you know what we did when we got to Paris? We went to see it, to see it again in a Paris uh, cinema and and of course it was in English and it had been do it, it had um, French subtitles at the bottom so of course it, it didn't really matter and I, and I think I'm right in saying that we even were allowed to drink a glass of beer in the French cinema when we were watching um, Batman but what a good film and I can't remember very many films that I've seen twice in uh, in the almost like successive evenings I thought it was so much so much good stuff about it. It was a lot darker than the TV series that everybody remembers from the 60s. You know, the, the, that film with Adam, uh, the, those that TV series with Adam Weston, it was quite camp, wasn't it? It was quite bright. It was quite colourful. Um, but I thought this was a lot darker, but it still had that good versus evil vibe going on about it. The gadgets were incredible everybody loved the gadgets kim bassinger was the uh the the lead the lead lady actor and the love interest for bruce wayne in the film and of course at the time kim bassinger was you know real real premier league actress i think everybody of my age group in the in the uh, 80s fancied her like mad as well um am i even allowed to say that but yeah everybody thought kim bassinger was just fantastic and 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 jack nicholson you know was just incredible as the joker i mean uh, yeah he was chewing the scenery like he often does but he's just got a way of chewing the scenery and making it 
um, unbelievable. And some of his lines, you know, I have made a name for my pain. And, you know, there's a winged freak terrorizing the city, but wait till they get a load of me. <laughs> All of those quotes were just fantastic. What an incredible film. Uh, massive memories. And I think because I saw it twice in Lancaster and then in Paris, just as in, indelibly sort of um, put it into my memory. Uh, yeah, and, and no, so 89, so we are leaving the 80s and we're going to start to get into the, the 90s, but is, this still felt like, like the 80s and your reference to Batmania, and we will talk about the marketing in a moment, but for me, what was unique as an experience and the, the whole event around it, I mean, that took over the whole of the summer. There were all the films in 1989, so very, very good one uh, out there, but the summer of 1989 was just taken over in a good way you know, because people got behind it by uh, this movie Batman and what was, was interesting is so I was in, living in Bordeaux at the time I was two years away from leaving Bordeaux to come and live in the UK I saw it twice as well now with my friends we saw documentaries uh, on TV of what was happening with the premieres in, in the US where um, people were dressed as Batman or the Joker and we thought that would be a very good idea to do so so imagine the group of six or seven of us and actually, I turned up dressed as a joker together with one of my friends and the others had bottled out. But so pretty much did everybody else in the cinema. So this was not embarrassing at all, Roger, to be the only people dressed as a joker. We went also with the, the whole white face and the, the lipstick and everything. We went for it and uh, just um, sat there feeling very hot because actually that makeup was drying. So the reason why <laughs> I went to say it twice, because the first time I couldn't enjoy the movie because of all the makeup and the very uncomfortable costume and hired to, to dress like the Joker, thinking that would be doing like the US. And of course, this is a French market. So the second time, I enjoyed it much, much better. For me as well, the highlight, which we're going to talk in a moment, was to see and hear the song of my hero, Prince, on the big screen. And that was something that I was looking forward to. But just to give you a, a bit of a segue into the, um, the Batman marketing, that Batman logo or stamp or mark, when they went for the black and gold, it was everywhere, Roger. Do you remember? You can look around at bus stops, but the size of buses. It was on packaging. You could you could buy um, toys, fruits. You could buy um, shirts, Walkmans. Everything had you not know, that that um, dark bat symbol. Although my poor mother was very confused because um, she saw it and came back home saying, "Why do we have a mouth?" A posted everywhere around town <laughs> and said, no, it's not a mouth, mum, it's a bat. You know, so it was lost on, on, on some people, bless her. So you mentioned the term Batmania. Uh, wh why do you think, you know, it, it, it has been used in that way? Because everybody was going absolutely batty <laughs> about Batman. I mean, it, 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 doing the research for this particular segment it was, was absolutely fascinating because, you know, it's a long time ago, but there's so much information out there about it because it literally was a massive, massive event. Uh, an event, it was probably one of the first event films, you know. And it's interesting, when you go back, there was a lot of people thought that this was going to be a complete flop. Yeah. They thought it was going to be a complete flop. Now, again, people remember the 1960s series. They had a lot of affection for it, but it was quite camp. It was very lighthearted, almost like a like a live action cartoon. You know, it always had those. You know, when they punch people, it would go thwack up on the on the screen and the sound effects. You know, it really was quite cheesy, and I guess people maybe thought that it was going to be like that and that it was not going to be a box office success. But, of course, the filmmakers had based it more around the Dark Knight books by Frank Miller, you know, much darker um, film, a much darker story, set in, in sort of the equivalent of New York. And, and at the time, New York was quite a scary place to live. Crime was really was high. Um, it was before they sort of got a grip on, on the crime wave in, in New York. And a lot of people associated themselves with it. But I think the genius of how the th filmmakers managed to create this Batmania was playing upon the memories that people had of that 1960s TV series. And a lot of the memories beyond the campness of it was that 
that logo that used to shine into the sky when Commissioner Gordon needed help from Batman. And this is probably the first film which was ever marketed around the concept purely of a logo. Now, none of the posters had Batman himself in it, or the city, or the Joker. It was purely the logo. Now, nowadays, you know, that is a, an established film marketing technique. We've seen it with Jurassic Park, to name another one. There's a specific logo that people recognize. But this was genuinely one of the first films built around specifically around a logo and i think the sim the glorious simplicity of it you know it was the logo and then 23rd of june that was it the logo and then 23rd of june and as you said it was everywhere and it became so recognizable that people wanted it on t-shirts they wanted it they wanted it on their hair you know people were having it shaved into their head and it just took off and the merchandising with the logo just took off and everybody wanted t-shirts they had you know really expensive um denim jackets really expensive leather jackets with this logo on it and and before you knew it it just became a snowball effect and it almost like took over the world and and that's why they call it batmania because literally everybody wanted something with this logo on it and to your point about the simplicity we know now through research that um you know, Tim Burton in particular went through hundreds and hundreds of uh, you know, examples and, and um, kind of uh, different tests with the poster. And I would imagine some of them may have been very complicated. Maybe they were doing the old fashioned, let's show all the actors and let's put Michael mm -hmm. Keaton, Jack Nicholson on. Because to your mm -hmm. point, I suppose the trailer did serve that purpose but there was not the usual of listing all the a-listers making sure that you know you go and see the movie because of michael keaton even though you don't know a thing about batman they didn't go there at all and i remember when i used to um buy film magazine i'm sure you did as well and i literally pleaded the news agent to keep the batman poster they had on the back of their wall and offered to pay for it because I wanted it in, in my bedroom. You know, that, that was kind of <laughs> the, the level. People used to steal posters from, you know, the sides of uh, bus stops and so on for themselves. It was just that element of having to own something that was part of the event. And um, as you heard a moment ago, then only two of us was dressed as the Joker, thinking we were, you know, back in, back in the US. The one thing that I wanted to um, mention to you then is this idea of the merchandise. And people make sometimes correlation between Star Wars, even Jaws and all the others. The big, big difference here is that it was more of a post-event mania with Star Wars and Jaws and Jurassic Park. With Batman, it was a pre-launch um, mania where the merchandise was being purchased before the, even, the, the movie had been seen by anybody, whereas typically it happens after. Yeah, and 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 again, the merchandising part of this is 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 really fascinating. You, you're absolutely right. Star Wars created this whole genre of toys, didn't it? The Star Wars figures, the uh, the models of Tie Fighters and Imperial Star Destroyers, and all of that. People wanted to buy, and a lot of these film studios thought that that was the start of a trend. And that from Star Wars onwards, every movie would just create a load of merchandise. But it didn't, did it? Because we saw films like E.T. in 1982. We saw Gremlins in 1984, Ghostbusters, Indiana Jones, all of those films of the 80s, which you would have expected to have created a merchandising rush, didn't. And I think that is exactly what why, because of what you've said, is that it was all post. It all came after Star Wars. And they didn't think enough about creating the demand and the and the desire for the merchandise within those films that followed star wars whereas the makers of batman absolutely had those gadgets and the merchandise in their heads as they were putting it together so they were leaking all of these um images of the batmobile and this that and the other well in advance and doing the deals to get this merchandise out there, as you say, before the film. And in addition to people wanting the T-shirts and wanting the, the these things stenciled into their heads, they were wanting to buy 
you know, the bat plane. They were wanting to buy the figures. They were wanting to buy the Batmobile before the film had even come out. And and I think that not only were they thinking about pre, like you've said, but they were also thinking as the Star Wars was after. And they were very careful that quite a lot of the tech in the film, like the Batmobile, they were specific that they didn't want the Batmobile to get blown up or damaged in any way in the film because they wanted it to survive so that people would then think, I've just got to have this. It's indestructible. I'm going to go and buy it. So you've got people buying it before the film, people buying it after the film. And it just went absolutely, it just added to this whole mania thing. People wanted all of this stuff. So, you know, the licensing arm of of the uh, of the film production company there was over 300 different items of batman stuff from trading cars to the t-shirts to the the models of the aeroplane to the models of the batmobile it was a merchandising paradise um and <laughs> it really did it was that that was the batman merchandising summer and you know it's a lesson in merchandising utopia i guess oh completely now one that has never been repeated ever since. Because, in fact, um, whilst they could afford it and it helped you know, the movie in no end to be a global success, there was also a waste. And eventually there was items that people didn't want to buy or they were producing in too great a volume. So it's why, in, in a way, Roger, this really is a moment in time in film history because it was never repeated. Uh, actually, if anything... Um, Warner Brothers, when we talked about Harry Potter, went the other way, which is to be actually much more exclusive about what they did. What was interesting, therefore, by the media coverage, because it is a big part of film marketing, there was almost two storylines. There was the, the movie itself and the history yeah. around the, the the graphic novel and so on. And there was the bat media uh, where the, the reporters who couldn't understand what on earth was going on. So there were the two forces at hand. And um, the one thing that they did, so not only do you have all that going on, but just in case people are not paying attention enough to Batman the movie, then they, of course, invite one of the most famous artists in the world, certainly um, in the 80s and 90s, Prince, who was signed to Warner Brothers' record label. Prince released, uh, released the Batman album. The Bat Dance was number one pretty much in every country I can think of and even had uh, other titles. Of the nine tracks you have on the album, four to five of those were released as singles. So there was this constant ambiance as well from the, the, the music of Prince playing on radios. There were remixes, there was B-sides uh, uh, playing on, on radio because that's what we had to. And of course, we used to listen to the Batman cassettes on our Walkmans. And if you've been lucky to buy the Sony Walkman with the Batman logo there, you were really it. Quick um, little surprise for you. Uh, I've mentioned on this show many times how much I love Prince work. Well, I can show you my 1989 Prince um, uh, Batman LP just for you. Ah. And they have respected, as you can see, the logo. You know, that's all you see on the front cover. And on the back, what they've done is list the, the tracks as if they are the characters in a film. You have the closing credits at the bottom and you have all the in purple now because, of course, this print has to be purple. You have all the credits for the directors, the filmmakers and so on. So the Batman album was also creating the sense of event. Now, the movie in the film is, of course, done by music composer Danny Elfman which is really uh, works with um, you know Tim Burton the same way Spielberg works with John Williams. What was very disappointing from the media's point of view, they created a fake war between Danny, Danny Helfman and Prince. And knowing enough about mm -hmm. music composers, they probably had mutual respect for each other and probably knew each other well. But you had the battle of the artists. You know, do you like Danny Elfman's music score or do you prefer Prince um, kind of LP? I suppose it is part of um, the many PR stunts. You could have a look at it. But we can't underestimate the power of the music choosing an artist. The only one that I can think of that's done it like that is almost a Bond franchise. Yeah, absolutely right. Um, I, this, the whole thing was it, it was an absolute joy to research. <laughs> and again, I suppose on the on the uh, you know we've we've now know that the the most up to date version of Batman, the Batman. You know, I've 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 heard mixed reviews about it. It's three hours long. People say there's only two scenes in daylight in the entire three hours. It's a bit 
dark, very dark. I mean, it's a lot. It probably makes the 1989 Batman now look as camp as the uh, six, the, the it made the 60s series look like. But if you are if you want to find out more about Batmania and how this film became so successful as a result of all this merchandise, as a result of the logo branding and the logo marketing. There's so much material out there on the internet to to do, to find out and to research this. Videos on YouTube, articles. And one of the best headlines I saw as I was researching this came from an article. The headline was Batman, Batmania, a triumph of shameless hype. And that is exactly how this film became so successful it was a triumph of shameless hype thank you so much roger it's been absolutely delightful to cast my mind back to a much younger self i was 20 in 1989 still studying finishing off just making you know my way to move to the uk and having a wonderful summer with my friends and looking back now even knowing how embarrassing I felt dressed as the Joker, I reckon I would still do it. Actually, I didn't even learn my lessons because when my pal Dominic and I went to see Prince in concert a year later, the Batman tour, we did it again anyway. So <laughs> glutton for, for punishment, uh, you know, it's been amazing. This has been number 70, Roger. It felt a very special episode because of uh, A, looking back at all the hard work, but also all the value we've been giving out there. The feedback from our audience is just delightful. Now, everyone, please leave your comments and suggestions in the usual places. Until the next time, make sure your marketing is done right. I was Pascal Fintoni, and he was Roger Edwards.